My name is Tom Poole. I work with Capital One, and uh, at Capital One, I lead the mobile and emerging channels team. And so, what that's about is building out all the consumer-facing, all the consumer-facing mobile apps uh, that we have, and how we manage that strategy, how we evolve it, what features we add, how we react to mobile payments, and the evolution that's taking place there, the revolution that's taking place there. Uh, and then socially, also, what do we do on the social space? And of course, how do those two integrate together? Uh, I think financial services broadly is still evolving in, in terms of full use of the gestures that are available today, right? So we've just seen the addition of multi-finger gestures with the release of the iPad 3 and the update to iOS. I don't think anybody's fully taken advantage of those. And in fact, many financial services companies, including ourselves, still have some gaps on, on just basic core service needs. And so in that sense, we're, we're a little less in a rush to get the gestures and a little more playing catch up on providing the, the meeting the ever-growing set of expectations our users have around what basic functionality should be in the app. Um, having said that, I think there is a there is a general opportunity, especially within financial services, to just to make it easier and more accessible. And I think gestures play a key role as far as one component of the interface that's going to make that possible. I think gamification, just better UX, better design is, is going to lead to that as well. In terms of just raw design standard, I, I think you're seeing a lot of embedded menus on left, right, bottom, top screens. Just a lot of drag motions from the very edge of the screen. Uh, you're seeing that feature prominently in the Windows 8 Metro UI. But I think if you look at the Facebook app itself, the mobile app, you're also seeing the latest app brings a lot of menus from the different sides of the screen that are that are contextual, related to the point in the device you're at. But it's, it's a user design standard that's become very popular, and certainly as it relates to big branded apps like Facebook, any time you have 300 million people using an app, it's almost become a design standard by default. And so what I think you see a lot of is they pioneer these standards, uh, they, they rapidly change those standards, and then you see them adopted by many other apps as a standard that it has then, the, the work of ed consumer education has taken place, people understand how those, those apps work, and designers' efforts to build in those layers of of menus and navigation actually yield fruit because I think a designer's worst fear is always that they build a navigation that no one ever uses or sees, right? They go through one exclusive path. But again, when somebody, when 300 million people use an app, uh, in Facebook's case, you're going to see a, a lot of that understanding carry through to other apps. And I think the same thing can be true, said to be true for most of the major social network apps and so much of what's social now is done through mobile devices. So we do a couple things. One, we always start out with a what we, we call a hothouse or an upfront sort of jam session of a couple days spent with designers, developers. Uh, in they're also, uh, in large companies, there can be a whole host of constituents who want to weigh in on the direction of the app. Getting them all in a room to get alignment around user experience and letting them confront the same challenges for both the happy path for the 80%, but also a lot of the unhappy paths for the 20% the of customers have unique needs or will have will represent the exception that needs to be handled very thoughtfully. Um, just so helpful to get alignment around the final product that's produced. Also, in those sessions, use, use of a lot of prototypes, just stubbed out apps that don't actually have connection to functionality, but are able, better than say Balsamics, to reflect the actual flow and feel and dragging and, and uh, the sort of interaction on the actual touch interface, huge in terms of getting benefit. On, on designers and developers co-locating, that's huge. I, I think there's an increasing trend for, for, it was mentioned today as code literacy. We're investing a lot of effort to train the most unlikely people to be fluent in how things are developed, not only so that you can encourage that the co-location is one thing, you can bring them together, but you want them to speak the same language, and you want your designers and, and even any other stakeholders always to be thinking about how the code can actually, how the code would actually be implemented to do something. So if they have enough understanding of that, I think you get a far better answer because they don't start with outlandish designs that won't actually be undevelopable. They start with an actual understanding of maybe we should use, if it's web development, maybe we should use Ajax here. This would produce a better experience. If it's mobile, they have some sense of the performance implications of HTML5 versus native development. Again, you, cannot, you can't leave that solely on the place of developers. You can't have designers and other in, intent creators sitting idly, again, dreaming up applications that are impossible to develop or will ultimately be changed at the development stage.